What do you know? Well, my guess is whether you went to school some, to advance your education or not, every one of you here knows something that the rest of us don't know. My grandfather immigrated here from Germany, uh, uh, and, and he never went to college. But he knew things about repairing those gigantic turbine generators that you find in dams that nobody else in the world knew. And nobody else had the patience to learn when he tried to teach them. Now, before I get off track with that, here's a follow-up question. See, because you all know something, have you ever tried to teach something to somebody else? And in the process of teaching, have you ever tried to teach something to somebody who didn't want to hear what you had to say? If you listen, much of our national political conversation sounds like that. It sounds like that same conversation that you have when, when you try to explain something to somebody who you know is wrong and they don't want to be corrected. We often find in these discussions that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Somewhere between the two sides, whatever they are, the truth lies somewhere between the two arguments that each of them are having. Each of them seems to have part of the truth and part of the, what they're arguing is not the truth. And, and if they would stop and listen to each other, it seems like they'd accomplish something. But neither side wants to be bothered with the truth. They just want to hang on tightly to their side. Everybody is quite happy with their version of the story, even if their version is demonstrably wrong. And, and they get angry if and when you try to tell them the truth. As soon as you disagree, for any reason, you are labeled as the enemy, seems like. And, and each side thinks that you belong to the other side, even if you're doing your very best to stay neutral. And, and they attack you simply because you disagree. Does any of that sound familiar to you? But as silly and ridiculous and tragic as it is, it isn't new. And politics isn't the only place where we find this sort of thing to be true. In Proverbs chapter 1, the, the writer of Proverbs uses a, a, a literary device, if you will. Uh, wisdom is described as a living person. A living person who is trying to speak truth into the world. And the world chooses to ignore her because they're quite happy with their ignorance. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. But since you refuse to listen when I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all of my advice, 
and do not accept my rebuke, I, in turn, will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurned my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Lady Wisdom, who is the personification of learning and intelligence, she asks, how long will you fools hate knowledge? Isn't that a great question? It's, it's like the folks that, that I chat with online who are, you know, uh, NASA and space and rocket enthusiasts, when, when one of the, us occasionally runs into those folks that believe the Earth is flat. Well, goodness gracious, do, do you reject all of science and physics and the Apollo moon missions? And good golly, how can you do that? How long will you fools hate knowledge? God pours out his thoughts and, and makes his teachings known, but ignoring his wisdom causes people to be destroyed by avoidable troubles and disasters. Proverbs says, the stubborn will eat the fruits of their stubbornness. The rebellious will be killed by their rebellion. The smug confidence of fools will destroy them. But those who listen to God and accept God's wisdom and accept God's correction, they will live in safety without fear of harm. That's great. That's, that's solid teaching. But, but what is it? that separates the fools from the faithful? What is it that makes one person wise and another a fool or worse? In Mark chapter 8, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples that really answers that very question. Mark chapter 8, verse 27, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages, uh, villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way... He asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, well, so, some say it's John the Baptist, and, and others say it's Elijah, and, and still others say it's one of the prophets. Now, how about you, Jesus asked. Who, who, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and, and, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things, the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. 
you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Peter was almost there. He almost had it. Peter saw what other people failed to see. They thought, wow, Jesus is really a great guy. Maybe he's a prophet. Maybe he's, he's one of these other guys that we knew in Scripture and came back to life. And Peter saw the truth. Peter knew that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the one that God had promised to Israel for generations. Peter knew. But Peter couldn't accept that Jesus had to die. Peter wanted Jesus to be king. Peter wanted Jesus to do things the way Peter wanted them done. Peter couldn't take that last step and accept that God would do things the way that God intended to do things. Jesus said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The key, Jesus says, is to have enough faith that you want what God wants and trust God enough to do things God's way. I've heard folks say, we, we want to follow God, but only in an advisory capacity. We're happy for God to do great things as long as he does them the way we expect him to do it. Jesus says the key is to have enough faith you want what God wants and trust God enough to do it God's way. And that's hard. Even the disciples struggled with that. And as we struggle along the way, there's a great many ways that we can and often do fall short. James chapter 3 we hear these words. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be strictly judged. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a very small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man 
can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. I'm reminded also of Scripture. It says, out of, the, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. James says, even if we get our act straight, even if we get our whole life together, together you know, uh, uh, we often still stumble when we fail to keep a tight rein on the words that come out of our mouths. But what comes out of our mouths reveals the truth about the contents of our heart. James says what comes out of our mouths can set our entire lives on fire. We can't have it both ways, he says. We can't praise God and curse our neighbors. We can't love God and hate the poor or love God and hate Democrats, or love God and hate Republicans, or Communists, or Antifa, or anybody else. You won't ever pick figs from an olive tree. You won't draw fresh water out of the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. When you give your heart to God, you need to give God your whole heart, your whole body, mind, and spirit. You need to be sold out to God. You need to be, in the, in the language of uh, Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, you need to be all in. When we choose to follow God and put our faith in Jesus Christ, we can't do it halfway. We can't give God 95% and hold back 5% for ourselves. As we see from James's description, the rudder on a ship compared to the size of the ship, it's not that big. But it steers the largest of ships. A tiny bit, uh, I mean a bit, you know, it, it is tiny compared to the size of a horse. It's literally the size of your index finger. But it takes the rider wherever she wants to go. Our tongues are small in comparison to the rest of our bodies, but, but our tongues can destroy everything we spent our entire lives building. How many times have we seen that on the national stage in, last, in the last 12 months? People who spent 40 years building a career in politics or entertainment or, or sports, and they said one thing they should not have said, and their career is done. We can destroy every bit of Christian witness that we tried to build with 30 years church attendance with one wrong word out of our mouth. So if we are truly going to put our faith in God, we need to give God everything that we have. We, we can't be fools who ignore God's wisdom and focus on human concerns. We can't follow God in an advisory capacity and expect God to do things the way we would have done them. How long 
will we wait? We need to want what God wants and trust God enough to do things God's way. We need to listen to what God's wisdom teaches, learn from it, accept it, and do it. We need to love our neighbors, loves our neighbors, even if they're Muslim neighbors, or Democrat neighbors, or Republican neighbors, or Mexican neighbors, or lesbian neighbors, or gay neighbors, or drunk neighbors. It doesn't matter. Our call is to love our neighbors. We can't hold anything back. Folks, following Jesus always was and always will be a really radical thing to do. Are you ready to be all in? Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, as something as simple as love that we thought we undo, and we open scriptures, and you make it hard. Please help. Help us to see the world with your eyes, to see our neighbors the way that you see our neighbors, and to love them the way that you love them. Help us to trust, to do things your way. Amen.